it is indeed an honor uh, and a pleasure to be with you today uh, here um, for this uh, strategic planning retreat and discussion, um, uh, and especially at this seminal moment. Um, it, it, in public policy, but in health care, um, and in health generally for our country as we stand literally uh, weeks away from the opening of uh, a whole new system of care uh, that promises to bring 30 million or more Americans into coverage <clears throat> for the first time ever and actually allows us to join, maybe not fully join, it might be an associate membership, um, thinking about the club here, um, the League of Nations that, you know, for so many years have guaranteed coverage for health care as a birthright and not a privilege. We, as you know, for most of our history, certainly for the last hundred years, we have been one of the few advanced democracies and wealthy nations that has failed to give its citizens access to affordable health coverage as a birthright. Um, we're about to cross that threshold. There's a lot of back and forth going on around the Affordable Care Act uh, in Washington in particular, <clears throat> inside the Beltway, but I know also outside and across the country. And there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of confusion about what the new law and this new health care system is going to look like, what changes it's going to bring, what changes it's going to require us to make, whether we're in direct health care delivery as 16th Street and Progressive and the other health centers here, whether we're in health professions education, training the next generation of caregivers, uh, <clears throat> not just physicians and dentists, but other licensed health professionals, uh, advanced practice nurses, um, and uh, physician assistants and nurse midwives. I understand you have a great nurse midwifery program. Uh, as one who actually had at my old health center uh, back in the 70s, um, a, a midwifery staffed birthing clinic system uh, that delivered literally about 1,200 babies a year. Um, fairly significant number for deep rural South Texas. Um, I understand the vital importance of having a team practice and when I talked to Dr. Waters uh, at the Chavez Clinic earlier today, we talked very briefly but about the team practice model that 16th Street and other health centers uh, utilize, which maximizes uh, the, the value and the um, uh, engagement of your clinicians in care, making sure that people get the, all the care they need um, and that your staff are working at the top of their training uh, uh, to do that, but in an appropriate team-based way. Um, and it actually is the more, uh, most effective and efficient system of care as well. Uh, as I say, we, we, right now as we meet, um, we are at sort of a seminal moment. Uh, in many ways, there's a lot of stuff going on in Washington, and I'll talk a little about that this afternoon, but I think you should take most of that with a grain of salt. You know, are they going to keep government, you know, keep the lights on in government after September 30th? Are they going to decide to pay the bills that they already, uh, for the work that they already ordered? Um, i.e. The, the borrowing limit, are they going to raise it to allow government to pay bills uh, that have, or, you know, were already approved um, by government? All of that stuff, it's, uh, we call it Kabuki Theater, um, Capitol Hill style. It's like a Gilbert and Sullivan opera. And they're back and forth, and they're back and forth, and, and then tighter to the railroad track, and along comes the train, and what's going to happen? Um, and it gets real crazy. Don't pay attention to too much of that. Take the long view. That's what I try to do. Um, <clears throat> and the long view is, it, it, it may be like uh, el burro pardo. Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. The old gray mayor. Um, that's how we make progress in this country. Um, uh, but, but it's always two steps forward, one step back. And that's a net plus. We're moving forward. And I think that's where we're headed today. Let me, let me begin by telling you a little bit about myself so you know who I am, what I care about, and why I do what I do. Um, John said I'm, I'm the head of policy for the National Association. And we have a staff of about 15 
um, in Washington that represents you, your health center and health centers all across America, um, not just up on Capitol Hill. We do legislative policy. We also do regulatory policy, so we work with the federal agencies, HHS and CMS and Medicare and Medicaid, et cetera, the Veterans Administration, uh, the Centers for Disease Control. There's uh, environmental and occupational health there. <clears throat> so we work with a lot of federal agencies uh, in a collaborative way. We monitor uh, not only laws moved through Congress, but also regulations and program uh, requirements and what have you. We also do state policy. We look very carefully. And I know here in Wisconsin there are some sticky state policy, health policy issues um, currently uh, bubbling um, here in this state, and there are in many, many other states. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we also have an advocacy, and I hope and trust that most of the, your staff, John, are signed up as health center advocates in our advocacy database. We have about 60,000 health center advocates, and it's staff and it's board members, by the way, of health centers all across the country who have agreed to be part of a process that when we need to send a message to our elected officials in Washington, your legislators, your members of Congress, your senators, um, or ask them to do something for the good of not just the health center, but the community and the people you serve. Um, uh, people have done that, and we try to make it easy. It's an online system that uh, <clears throat> you might get a couple of notices a month asking you to contact your member, and you can do it in about three minutes online. Click, click, click. Actually, you can do it in one minute if you don't want to change the message, if you want to send the message that we pre-populate. But if you want to add a personal thing, which I always do, I talk about the health center in my hometown of Alexandria, Virginia, so I always say, and the Arlandria Clinic, you know, uh, in the message uh, to make it personal for my senators and my congressmen. Uh, we do that. That's part of my operation. And then another part, which I place great value on, and I think there's some folks who see value in this as well here in this room, is research and data. Because if you can't tell your story, you're never going to get a policymaker whether that's a member of Congress, a congressional staffer, a, a, a bureaucrat at the federal level or at the state level, to understand what your need is and understand what your ask is when you're asking them to do something. Is it just political pressure you're trying to put on me? Paul knows this because we worked together on some things over the years. If you just go to a member of Congress and say, I need you to vote this way on this issue without being able to say, 22,000 people in Southside Milwaukee will be affected by this. And if it, doesn't, if it isn't done the right way, most of those people will be hurt. They'll lose coverage. They'll lose care. <clears throat> we, may have to, we may have to cut the, the staff of the Chavez site in half and cut our hours down and end up serving fewer people. Or alternatively, if you support this change, we will be able to expand the care in Milwaukee and now Waukesha. Um, and other parts of our community to serve more people. I think being able to tell that story is vitally important. So research and data, some people, in some national organizations like ours, that's over here with the clinical thing or it's over there in the research lab of some kind. It's part of our policy division within NAC because it's so important. Back to me. So I started my life, uh, my adult life, uh, as a VISTA volunteer, um, right out of school, I'm a New England kid, born and bred, went to school up in Boston, uh, and when I finished school, um, I signed up for the VISTA program and agreed to go two-thirds of the way across the country down to deep South Texas, down at the lower end of the Rio Grande Valley, where I could literally throw a, a stone over the Rio Grande into Mexico a uh, place called Brownsville, Texas. Um, why did I go there? What plan did I have? I don't know. I, I just knew I wanted to try to make a difference of some kind in people's lives. Um, and so with a few other VISTA volunteers, uh, we organized some community groups. Um, 
kind of like uh, our president did in Southside Chicago. He was a community organizer. But we organized them for, to help them try to figure out what could be done to improve uh, their conditions and, and their collective destinies. And when we asked the communities, what do you need? What can we help you get for this community? The universal answer right off the top was health care. In fact, the way I like to tell the story, the answer was health care kid, go get us some. So with the help of a couple of local young health professionals from the local health department, we put together a grant application for something called a migrant health center for farm workers. There was no community health center program in 1968. In law, there was only the migrant health program having been signed into law by John F. Kennedy in 1962. <clears throat> um, uh, but this was home base for a lot of farm workers. <clears throat> the community health or neighborhood health center program did exist. It was a demonstration program in what was called the War on Poverty effort, uh, the Federal Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, but we didn't know about that. We only knew about this migrant health program. So we submitted an application, took several months, actually had to fly up to Washington to do a little lobbying. 23 years old, I'm lobbying my senator and my congressman, get, the, get us this grant so we can get some health care. Took a little while, but the grant finally came through. So I proudly brought it back and said, here's your health care to the community. They said, that's nice, kid, now we'll run it. I said, I'm 23 years old. My major, I don't know squat about health care. I've never managed any, but can't even manage myself. And I, my major was modern languages. Espanol, gracias a Dios. Thank God it worked. And they said, we don't care about any of that. You know, run the program. Get it up off the ground and do it. So we did. And for seven, eight years, uh, directed a health center down there. Uh, and the experience of that I carry with me today 40 years later. <clears throat> uh, not only the practical real world understanding of what it takes to operate a health center to provide health care, uh, to be connected to the community you serve through your community board, through your patients, through the people you care for. Um, but how little did I realize when I started on that journey, what treasures and pleasures this journey would hold for me um, and how it would end up being the path for my life. Here I am 40 years later, you can call it arrested development, but I'm still doing the same thing on a bit bigger scale is all. Um, that's what I care about and that's why I'm here in the job I have today and that's why I'm here talking to you today. Um, because I believe in this program, I believe that community health centers have made a profound impact on not just the health and well-being of the 22 million people that health centers serve all across America today, including the 30,000 plus that 16th Street serves, but even beyond that, okay, to the healthcare system itself. Uh, it is the one place in America where the people getting health care, it's, it's 0.5% of health spending in America. That's what health centers occupy. 0.5% of a $2.5 trillion landscape, okay? Um, and yet, it's the only 0.5% of the entire healthcare system where the people getting the care have a role in deciding how that care is organized and delivered through the community board. Um, and the community board members are also my heroes. How many board members do we have here? Who are you? You're my heroes, because how much do you get paid to do that for John? Did he really? <laughs> Damn. Two times zero is what? <laughs> you do it for the love of the community, because you care about this community and you want to see it get better. You want to improve life and the well-being of the community. The health, yes, but beyond that, okay? The civic life of the community as well. But health care is a way that you can do it. Um, and that is so vitally important. And there's no other, I mean, hospitals, you were on one, hospitals have uh, community boards or, you know, more or less. But in terms of the community we're talking about, the community of people that served, it is rare in America 
that a health care system has the people of that community, the underserved, the vulnerable, the forgotten, the left behind, serving on the board with a voice. And by the way, I speak fully aware of what I call the agony and the ecstasy of working for a community board. As I've told some friends, if it wasn't indecent, I would show you the scars I still have from my experience, you know? When I would come up with this great idea and the community board, especially my consumer board members would say, what planet did you get that idea on? That's not gonna work here. They tell me that all the time. <laughs> but that's their job, John. And that's exactly what we need. I remember when my board members came to me and said, we don't have enough prenatal care. We, uh, we have lay midwives, they call them parteras, uh, untrained lay midwives doing a third of the births and deliveries in South Texas because there weren't enough uh, physicians, you know, GPs and OBGYNs, um, and there was so much need. Um, and there, were story, uh, there was story after story of babies burying shoeboxes, fetuses, burying shoeboxes in the backyard of Barteras for a botched delivery. And many, many stories of women who experienced a complication, preeclampsia or something like that, packed in a cab to the hospital, no medical record, no referral, no communication between the Partera and the hospital folks. Just the mother arrive, arrives in labor in distress. Um, and guess what? The, the outcome was almost always terrible. Um, and so my board said, we got to do something about that. So like you, John, we recruited, because <clears throat> we couldn't, you know, afford a bunch of OBGYNs and what have you. We had to work with what we had. We recruited a couple of nurse midwives. And then I sent them to talk to the local OBGYNs. I said, you got to cool them out <clears throat> and figure out how to work with them. And we did. And we set up the birthing clinics right across the street from hospitals in two of the towns. They weren't cities, but two of the towns where we had sites and started providing prenatal care and delivering babies. And it was the board that said, you got to do that. And it was the board that looked at, <laughs> they listened to our clinicians who came in to a board meeting one time complaining of an epidemic of upper GI uh, uh, and distress, gastrointestinal distress and what have you. Um, and what we learned was that in the outlying areas of these communities, there were what they call colonias, villages, with um, dirt roads, no running water, no sewer, no electricity. The homes were barely like what you see when you look at stories of the favelas in, in Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro, uh, third world, uh, just, just ramshackle shacks with screens for windows, no, gla no glass. Um, and oh, by the way, the heating system is the wash basin with some mesquite wood in it. Um, and with no running water and no sewage, you can imagine the health conditions that the families brought into the health center. And my board said, we got to do something about that. Talk about environmental health. I maintain 40 years later that the best thing my old health center did for that community, yes, was a lot of health care and it was wonderful, but it was the potable water and sewer system that they got another community group to do, to find money for and to run sewer and water lines into those communities. The GI distress rate dropped like a rock at our health center, again, this is about personal health. It is about the individual care that your health centers provide every day to hundreds of people every day. But it's also about the broader community health. What are the problems in the community that you see that the health center can play a role? Maybe it can't always be the one to do, but it can play a role. It can be a supporter. It can be an agitator sometimes for community improvement. John tells me about the work that 16th Street under your leadership has done in community development. It's about jobs. It's about jobs and well-being for the people in your community. And the health center can't say, well, that's not about medical care, so it's not our job. Yes, it is. All of this is our job. And it is so vitally important. Health centers embody the vision of their initial founders People like Jack Geiger, 
a guy who, at 22, having graduated from college, not being sure, familiar story to me, not being sure what he was going to do with his life <coughs> after rooting around and doing some journalism stuff, um, first of all, World War II, it was World War II, felt the need to sign up for um, and do his patriotic duty. But Jack was brought up by a um, very faith-filled, patriotic family, but one that understood that racism in America was a stain on our soul and our people. And, and he refused to sign up and, en and, en and enlist in any service, American service in World War II that was segregated. Well, let's see, what did we have in World War II that wasn't segregated? Not the Army, not the Air Force, not the Navy, not the Marines. There was only one uniform service that was integrated called the Merchant Marine. The floating bathtubs where they took the tanks and other stuff across the Atlantic and got shot at by U-boats, pretty much sitting ducks. Uh, that's what Jack did for three years in World War II. Thank God he made it through it alive. Um, and obviously the material that he and his colleagues, <coughs> uh, merchant marine folks delivered, made the difference in, in the outcome of World War II. Um, and then he decided to go to medical school. Pretty old to do that, but he thought it was a good idea. While he was in medical school, as a third year medical student, he finagled a fellowship I think it was from the Ford Foundation, to go to South Africa. Now, this was not Nelson Mandela's South Africa. This is 1958. It was even before Pierre Botha, but it was apartheid South Africa, a terrible land where the three million non-native South Africans controlled the government and left the 23 million native South Africans stateless, powerless. Um, used a great American, we were talking about this, Ellen and I, on the way over when she showed me the casino. Um, we, have, we, we do have a great history in this country of giving the crappiest land uh, of all to our native first, you know, peoples here. Um, and then telling them, you're sovereigns, you can do anything you want on that land. Of course, then they open a casino. And I'm sure the mayor is saying, hey, yo, we want some of that money. That's the way it, uh, what goes around comes around. But, but in South Africa, uh, they adopted a similar policy where they created, they carved out the lousiest land and they called them homelands. And they told the native South Africans, you can all go there and you can have your own sovereign government and we won't tell you what to do. You can do whatever you want. Now, don't ask us for a whole lot of help. But we'll do what we can. Well, in the late 50s, <coughs> some very uh, visionary public health uh, uh, individuals from Britain and from America had gone to South Africa to try to help the folks in their native homelands develop some system of education and health care and other basic services for the folks living in these really pretty uh, 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 desperate homelands. And Jack worked in a clinic um, in, in one of those homelands in South Africa for a year. He was supposed to go for a semester. He finagled a full year. Um, came back, he finished medical school. Um, he then formed the Medical Committee for Human Rights, which was the healthcare arm of the civil rights movement. And Jack and a guy named Count Gibson. Jack was from New York, Brooklyn Jew, born and raised. And a guy named Count Gibson, who was a son of the South, white, born to privilege outside of Atlanta. His parents were both physicians. Um, a true Southern gentleman of all kinds, but one who felt, had a deep pain in his heart for what our country was doing at the time to its people of color. So Jack and, and Count kind of joined together, formed this Medical Committee for Human Rights. They were at the Edmund Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday when the Alabama State Troopers opened up with their batons on the peaceful marchers, Martin Luther King and others, uh, one of whom was John Lewis. If you watched any of the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, John Lewis was a feisty young head of the SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was a, a pretty 
I wouldn't say radical, but agitated group of young African Americans trying to make change. They weren't too happy with Martin Luther King. They felt he was too, too easy going. Anyhow, though, they're all together at the Edmund Pettus Bridge on marching from Selma to Montgomery. What were they marching for? Anybody remember? Voting rights. They just wanted to be able to register to vote. You know, I went to South Texas in 1968, and I still have today, what's that, 45 years later? A poll tax receipt. Two dollars that I had to pay to vote for the privilege of voting. Now what, you know, in 1968, what poor person could afford two bucks? As opposed to putting food on the family's table. Guess what happened? But these folks were marching for the right to register to vote when the troopers opened up on them. And one of them was John Lewis. And, and a, <clears throat> a trooper's baton cracked his head wide open. He was bleeding on the side of the road. Thank God by then Count Gibson had a position as the chair of the Department of Preventive Medicine at Tufts University in Boston. Who knew? Um, and they medevaced John from Selma, Alabama to Boston. <clears throat> and I just, and obviously the story, you know the conclusion. They saved his life. Um, and, and he literally, I was there maybe 15, 20 years ago at one of our events in Washington where we were honoring. John is now the congressman from the 5th District of Georgia representing Atlanta um, and a highly revered, a respected and appreciated member of Congress. And we were giving him an award. And in a room about twice as big as this with people along the walls and everything, uh, John came in and Jack Geiger happened to be visiting us that year. He's still alive and kicking at 87 years old. We hope he's going to be around to celebrate the 50th anniversary of health centers uh, in, in two years. Um, but Jack was over in the other corner and John, who is a bear of a man, not very tall, but very bulky. And he looked across the room and he pointed like this and he said, you saved my life. And he made a beeline over and Jack is a, a whippet of a person. He's uh, smaller than Paul. Skinnier than Paul, too. Of course, Paul can tell, tell, us when, tell the world when we were both skinnier, right? But anyhow, he's really a snippet of a person. And, and John Lewis grabbed him like this. And you remember that thing during the campaign when the, the guy, the pizza parlor guy, did this with Barack Obama? Swung him around with his feet flying? This is what John Lewis did to, to Jack Geiger. That's the kind of guy Jack Geiger was. And so in 1965, when the Office of Economic Opportunity started giving out grants for a preschool program that was part of the War on Poverty effort. Anybody remember what the name of that program was and is today? Head Start. Amazing. It is one of the programs. And by the way, VISTA was another War on Poverty effort. And guess what else is? Health centers. At their beginning, health centers were part of the War on Poverty effort as well, the demonstration program. Um, uh, that started the, the program. Well, but they started with Head Start. So they were giving grants out to community groups to start preschool education programs. Um, another great unfinished and unmet need in this country. We still have millions of preschool children who aren't able to um, benefit from preschool education and they suffer for the rest of their lives as a result. Uh, unpaid political advertisement. Um, but they started giving grants out to community groups. Today, a lot of the Head Start money goes to school districts, and that's probably good, because then it integrates preschool with regular school age, K-12 age um, education. But back then, it was community groups. And pretty soon, the Poobahs in Washington, which included, by the way, Sarge Shriver, the brother-in-law of President Kennedy, um, uh, and Senator Ted Kennedy and Senator Bobby Kennedy, who ran the Office of Economic Opportunity, got phone calls from some of the Head Start grantees in Mississippi and Alabama. Uh, we got a problem down here. Well, what's your problem? These kids are so sick that we can't begin to give them education until we get them some health care. And of course, the Poobah said, okay, well, let me think of, okay, here's what you do. The money we gave you for the Head Start grant, you don't have to spend it all right now, okay? You're not going to run out of money. Use some of that 
and give them, give the kids vouchers, get them to the local doctor and use the money to pay the bill, we'll reimburse you for that after the fact. And the call came back in and said, you don't understand. This is Alabama. All our kids are African American, all the doctors are white. They won't see them. They won't care for them. And it was at that point that the folks in the war on poverty effort understood that if they were going to establish a system of health care, remember that Medicaid was created in the sa at the same time as Medicare as coverage. Community health centers were also created about the same time. And the folks at OEO understood that if they were going to establish a system of health care, they couldn't just voucher it out. They couldn't do an insurance type thing. How many stories did we hear of women in Mississippi and Alabama with Medicaid who were forced to deliver their baby in the parking lot of the hospital because the hospital would not care for them, would not let them in the door? That was health care back then. Thank God it's not like that today. But the folks at the War on Poverty Agency understood that if a mechanism was going to be created to deliver, to provide health care to folks who had for so long been left out of the system, forgotten, left behind, etc. It was going to have to be done in conjunction with the community. It was going to have to be a whole new system of care that would be developed. It was going to have to be one that focused on community health, not just individual personal health, and not just population health or public health. It had to be both. They had to operate at the crossroads of personal and public health for the benefit of the community. And that was Jack Geiger's idea that he brought back from South Africa. Those clinics he worked in in South Africa with those public health professionals in apartheid South Africa. They had a community board that decided what hours the health center, the clinic would be open and decided on what kind of services were needed so that the staff could recruit the clinic clinicians needed and the professionals needed to deliver and decided what people would be charged and what do you do with a patient who might could pay but doesn't or resists paying even the minimal fee how do you deal with them it was that community board that grappled with those issues because it understood it was from the community it was people who actually got care at the clinic who were making these decisions and that's exactly what was needed here in America. And so people like Jack Geiger who ran one of the first health centers in America in a small delta town in Mississippi called Mom Bayou and Count Gibson who ran the other initial health center in Boston, Tufts University, they had to do something in Boston um, since they were given the grant to Tufts uh, to operate these health centers. Um, uh, they started a, a, a vision, an idea, a system of care that would be different from the way that so much else in the healthcare system operated. That's what health centers are and have been, and it is still what they remain to this day. Um, it's different. John and Paul and I remember when, what was the grant? When you first started, what was the grant as a percentage of your total budget, the federal grant? 60, 70? No, our first grant that we got in 1983 was uh, $280,000. And, and what was your total budget? $290,000. <laughs> That's my point. It was what percentage of your total budget was the grant? The grant came from the Office of came from OEO? Yeah, yeah. I'm not surprised at all. Um, yeah, and when you got your first grant, I think it was 82, but that, you know, the federal HHS grant, you had grants before that. But in those days, when I left my health center in Texas, the grant was like 80% of the budget. Today, what's the federal grant as a percent of your budget? I'll bet it's less than 20, probably, probably less than 10. There are places in America, there are health centers in America where the grant is less than 5%. And you know the irony? All the strings that come with that grant, the community board, 
the quality assurance systems, the reporting UDS, and you know, A133 audit. I know you're tearing your hair out, right? <laughs> Why do we do this? There is something that keeps us together. There's something that keeps these health centers that could probably blow off the grant and say, you know what, let's just go be a business. Uh, and, and, and might end up in some ways better. Uh, although we've worked very hard to provide enough other benefits uh, that come along with being a health center to provide enough of an incentive to stay. But, but I still think when the grant is five or less than 10% of the budget, it might be relatively easy for a health center to walk away from that grant. But there's something that keeps 16th Street and Progressive and other health centers in America that could probably live without the grant. There's something that keeps them in the family. And I think it's a commitment to the mission, values, purpose, and history of health centers. I've read your strategic plan. And when I open that plan up, John, and I, I see your nefarious hand in there, uh, but also the input of the board members, et cetera, and I look at the mission statement and the values, and the priorities of your plan, it is so rock solid in line with the vision of what health centers can be and should be for their communities in communities all across America. That's what unites us, is the focus on the community and how can we better meet their needs. So here we stand today, almost 50 years later, and we now have a system of care that serves 22 million people. Where are we headed? What's the future? Where are we going? Here we're now on the cusp of realizing almost universal coverage. And there are some people, you know that, in Washington, some of our friends who say, well, once we get universal coverage and everybody has insurance, we don't need you. People can go wherever they want to go, right? They'll have they will most certainly find providers who speak their language, who understand their culture, who are open when they can afford to go without losing their job and losing money, etc. Right? There are providers like that all across America. We don't need health centers to do that. We don't need health centers to worry about environmental and community health and the social conditions of health, housing and nutrition and education and employment. There are providers who care about that stuff out there, aren't there? On every street corner. So we give them health insurance and you guys can go out of business. You think? Do you think? I, I doubt it. I doubt, yeah, impossible. I like that. That's better. Unlikely is the way I'd put it, just being polite. Um, so there is a place for the type of health care that health centers provide. And by the way, let me say something here. This is not about just being the gap filler, being the last resort, being the last stop before the end of the line, a place where people go because they have no other choice. I hope and I trust that that's not true. And I know, John, with your NCQA certification as a primary care medical home, level three, do you know how many Level three medical homes there are in them. Of the 1,200 health centers all across America, I think we got 35 level threes, John. That's it. There's lots of level ones, but you know that that's much less complex than a level three. That means you've got an electronic health re record system that is functioning, functional, and working to do the right kinds of things to help you measure both the quality and the appropriateness of the care that you provide. Uh, your joint commission accreditation. Um, which preceded that by many years, I know. But uh, I have always said that I hope that any health center I'm connected with, and that since I'm connected with all of them, that means I guess all of them, um, would be the kind of place that I would want to go to, not have to. I would want to go to having the choices that I have in my life that I would want to go to, to get the best care. Um, in an efficient, effective, caring, high quality manner. So it is about access. Access is about making yourselves available to those who, other, especially to those who otherwise 
have few or no other choices. Access is about reaching out to those parts of the community that feel disaffected, unappreciated, uh, unrecognized, okay? It is all of that. Uh, access is about being available nights and weekends when people who work for a living but don't get time off from work and could lose their job to take two hours off to take the kid to the doctor or take themselves to the doctor. Um, it is about being accessible, available, affordable, appropriate, all of those A's. And that's what health centers are. That's what I know your health center strives to be. And I'm here, if nothing else today, let my message to you be, you are not alone. You are part of a great, we still call it a movement, don't we? People say that's so 60s. But you know, but you know, really, what, what, you know, people say you're more like a social club. You all go drinking together and stuff like that. Nah, maybe in the old days we did when we were younger, right? Too old for that stuff anymore. Seriously, what, what, what is a movement at, after all? It is a group of people with a common vision, a common goal, a common purpose, and a common commitment to make a difference in this or that or the other. And for us, it's health care. It's health care access, but it's health care quality. And let me not leave the third leg of the three-legged stool, effectiveness and efficiency. Because even good access and high level quality doesn't mean much if it's not delivered in the most effective and efficient way possible. We can't afford, we, one out of every five dollars in this country are spent on health care. It is outrageous that as much of our economy is spent on health care as it is. What does it squeeze out? Housing, education, human services, employment, there's so much else, even just leisure time. The, the amount of money you can put into parks and, and playgrounds for kids. There's so much else that is needed. And healthcare is this behemoth. That's, it's like Pac-Man, like a giant Pac-Man. It just keeps consuming more and more of the economy. And when it does, it crowds out everything else. Do you know there was a time when food accounted for one-third of the average family's budget, one out of every three dollars that you spent was on food, okay? Not counting going out, I won't ask you. I I'll tell you, for my family, uh, even when I had seven kids at home, food didn't account for even 10% of our budget. It was significant, but it really didn't account for much more than that. And that was, you know, in the 80s when the kids were growing up. <laughs> and they were like, you know, voracious. They'd come home and clean out the refrigerator, had to restock it every night. But, you know, it, it, the, the, the efficiency of production of our foodstuffs in America has lowered the amount of money that we have to spend as a proportion of our budgets. The amount of money we've had to spend for food and allowed that money to be used for other things. Leisure time, um, I suppose boats out on the river, go fishing, whatever. But, <clears throat> but it's allowed that to be a... We, meanwhile, however, the healthcare Pac-Man keeps gobbling up more and more of our economy. We have an individual and collective responsibility to make a difference in that. And the biggest way that health centers can make a difference, there's only so much efficiency, efficiency you can squeeze out of a primary care visit. But where you can make a difference is where. If you give good primary care, where do the savings mount up? <coughs> Ancillary services, yeah. Diagnostics, MRIs and CAT scans, unnecessary ones. How about ER visits? Emergency room visits, where it can cost you $1,000 even if you just got a hangnail, okay? And by the way, no continuity of care. The next time you go back into that ER and you say, yeah, I was here a couple of weeks ago, you think they find your record? <laughs> Good luck, okay? Um, hospital admissions and readmissions. I think you guys just did something recently where your impact on readmission rates was phenomenal. 
and even specialty care. If the care can be provided in that primary care setting, okay, uh, whether it's done by a specialist who comes into the setting or by a primary care provider who is linked in and connected with in a collegial way with specialists who can, they can consult as needed, how much money could we save? You know that the studies done on health centers show, and this is using data tapes like for Medicaid, so they capture the total cost of care. Do you know that a Medicaid patient who gets care at a health center costs 24% less? That's $1,200 a year per patient less than a Medicaid individual enrollee who goes, gets care someplace else. 1200 bucks a year. 22 million patients we serve. Do the math. How much do we save America's health care system today? It's over $20 billion, and that's billion with a B, okay? For taxpayers, for private payers, for you and me. So we're doing our good part to provide care that is effective and efficient, and that's critically important. Let me quick transition to, so where are we at and what's the future? I mentioned that your meeting occurs right now at a seminal moment uh, as Congress grapples with where they're going to go uh, 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 in implementing the Affordable Care Act and moving us forward in that direction. Uh, I wish I could tell you, I wish, you know, I shook my crystal ball the other day and I said, will they reach agreement to keep government open? And the answer came back, try again later, <laughs> you know, sorry, don't know. Um, for the 35 years I've been doing this, I've always felt like, uh, uh, and people would laugh at me, they would say, you, you got it down. You always could figure out what the final, the end game is. I don't know what the end game, and I sat with Tom Daschle. Tom is a former Senate Majority Leader from South Dakota. Um, great guy, great guy. Um, but he served as the Senate Majority and Minority Leader while he was up there. He served better than 20 years um, in the Senate. Um, and we were with him yesterday morning, Tom and I chatting, having breakfast. And I said, Tom, where's, where's, it gonna, where's it going? Where's it going to end? He said, Dan, I wish I could tell you. I have no idea. I talk with these folks every day, and uh, we can't figure it out. Uh, but I'll give you my best shot at it. There's, it's Kabuki Theater, remember what I said. So they'll do the, you know, Mikado, whatever that Gilbert and Sullivan opera was. So they'll do the Mikado. Uh, and on September 29th, because we run out of, we got we to gotta act by September 30th to keep the doors open and the lights on in government. They'll pass a short-term resolution, which is a temporary funding bill that will keep the doors open and keep the money flowing to federal programs like health centers, but also the Medicare checks and the uh, Social Security checks coming in, VA, um, and the Defense Department functioning. Um, they'll do that. Uh, what they're going to do is a short-term uh, funding bill that'll keep things going until mid to be somewhere between mid-November and mid-December. But then they hit the big Megillah, which is the government's borrowing limit, what's called the debt limit or the debt ceiling. Um, and again, I say that is giving themselves permission to pay the bills for the stuff they ordered last year, the year before, and the year before that. For, for programs that were approved and funded before, as those expenditures add up. I was reading an article in the paper on the plane on the way out today, and yesterday, according to the New York Times, <coughs> um, we took in, it was somewhere around a hundred and, no, three hundred and ninety billion dollars in revenue came in, okay, from taxes, from other kinds of receipts and what have you, from uh, um, the sale of land uh, and st stuff like that. So we took in about three hundred and ninety, we spent four hundred, okay, on Medicare, on Social Security, on VA, on defense, etc., just in one day. Ten billion out of four hundred. That's not a huge, it's like a 2.5% excess. You dealt with, uh, where's our 
treasurer here. Uh, you've dealt with uh, situations in periods of time when the outgo is a little bit greater than the income, but 2.5% doesn't seem deadly, except that that's every day. In fact, that might have been a good day on the revenue side, okay, and a slow day on the expense side. So other days, the, the gap is greater. Um, but each day, the money that comes in and the money that goes out is according to what's already been approved by the Congress and signed into law by the President. So this craziness of refusing to raise the borrowing limit to allow us to accommodate that shortfall while we get our arms around the bigger question of how do we get a point to a point where the income is equal to or greater than the outgo and we're not building up further debt. We haven't gotten there yet. We haven't figured out. And I think, you know, my own personal view is that we have so, had so many tax cuts over the last 10, 15 years that we are seriously underfunding government. I know it doesn't feel like it at tax time when your bill comes due and you got to send in that check to the IRS, but we want more than we can afford. Um, and we either have to cut back what we want or we have to ask ourselves to put more money aside to pay for what we say we want and we've approved. And I don't mean just Congress, I mean the American public. Because when somebody says, well, cut spending, and you say, okay, well, what part of Medicare would you cut? Who would you throw off Social Security? What part of the Veterans Program would you cut? What about the fence? You want to cut those uh, boats in the Mediterranean right now that are sitting there, you know, on watch, trying to figure out what's going to happen in Syria? I don't think so. A lot of stuff that's vitally important. But what people say, phrase, waste, fraud, and abuse. Yeah, but you've got to name it. Where is it? It's not so easy to find. Um, so at some point, Congress is going to have to vote to raise the ceiling of what can be borrowed so that we can not just keep the doors on, because if Congress fails to do that, our whole economy comes down. It's not just that the doors get shut, you know, the lights go off in the federal buildings here, um, and John doesn't get his, you know, check from the federal, from HHS to be able to pay, make payroll and what have you. Much worse with the, uh, the debt limit. Our whole economy tanks. Oh, the Ging Gingrich, when they shut down government, that was, yeah, that was. It was about a week before it happened. I threw down the entire federal grant. <laughs> you may need to do that again, John. But see, that's, that's the continuing resolution. That's the first thing that happened September 30th. And yes, there were not one, but three uh, brief showdowns in that period in the fight between Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton. They had this spat and uh, couldn't agree, and on three successive occasions in October, November, and, and January, for a few days, they shut down government, and, and, and the American public went crazy. People who were going to, like, Yellowstone Park found out that the park was closed, and they were going there on the holiday, and they were ripped. What's going on here? So the folks who had voted not to continue funding government got hammered. That was Gingrich's party and they, they uh, really took it in the air. I think something like that could happen again. But this debt limit thing is even far more serious. We have never, ever, ever refused to raise the borrowing limit to allow us to accommodate again money that was already approved, expenditures that were approved, and which have exceeded the, you know, the income on any given day. That is the trickier one. That's the one that at least the House Republicans now say that they are going to tie to a vote on Obamacare, to repeal Obamacare. They're going to tie it to that. I wish I could tell you what's going to happen on that. I, it, it's craziness, but there is a group of about 100 House members who are absolutely committed. Um, it has become almost like jihad for them, an article of faith that Obamacare is like communism, that it's going to put us on a path to, you know, dissolution or whatever, and that therefore it must be stopped. And they're demanding 
that the president agree to stop Obamacare, at least temporarily, like for a year, as the price for their agreeing to raise the borrowing limit. That's the craziness that's going on inside the building. So what can you do? What can we all do in the face of this insanity? Well, I'll tell you what I'm doing. Just keep your head down and keep moving forward, doing what you know how to do, what you're so good at, what your purpose is fulfilling. That's what each of us needs to do, is just keep moving forward as best we possibly can. In the end, I believe there may be some fits and starts, um, and, and like the Burro Pardo, the old gray mayor, maybe two more steps up and then one step back, but we'll get through this. The longer view is that in passing the Affordable Care Act, which <coughs> strives to get us to 94% coverage, not universal, we're still going to have 6% of the population. You know how many people that is? 30 plus million who will remain uninsured. And oh, by the way, for anybody who thinks that those 30 million are just the illegals, undocumented, 5 million undocumented. The other 26 million who will remain uninsured, people who can't afford the premiums, we were talking earlier about that, people who um, don't know about, I mean, they just live a life where they don't pay attention to what's going on. They know nothing about the individual mandate, the requirement to buy coverage, the, these exchanges, these marketplaces that are going to be set up. They know nothing about any of that. Uh, and they live, I'm going to call it in blissful ignorance, they live their lives um, and not necessarily as part of the larger world. Um, and then there are those who uh, simply refuse refuse they'll pay the penalty the first year penalty for not having insurance is 95 bucks no big deal you know it rises pretty quickly thereafter to two and three hundred and then two and three percent of income so it gets pretty pricey to do that but in the beginning there will be people who refuse so there will be 30 million people who will remain uninsured I think the biggest group will be those who can't afford the premiums and can't afford the coverage that's a real concern. That's really the population that health centers were founded to serve, is folks who are left out because coverage is unaffordable. It's a shame that we have this Affordable, affordable Care Act, named Affordable Care, that's going to prove to be unaffordable to millions of Americans. But that's what you're there for. And that's what you're going to need to do. Now, how are you going to do that? Well. The Affordable Care Act included $11 billion, quite apart from the expansion of Medicaid coverage and the provision of subsidies to others to buy private insurance coverage. The Affordable Care Act included $11 billion over five years to expand health centers. Um, and of course, on the one hand, Congress took a chunk of that back, about a third of it, three and a half billion, when they cut in 2011 and 2012, and let me note here, if I could, that when Congress came back and cut the health center growth fund in the Affordable Care Act, it was not an anti-health center act. I mean, even those who voted for that cut said, this is not about you, it's about Obamacare. It was an anti-Obamacare vote. Uh, there was money sitting there, there was this money, there was the prevention and public health fund that they slashed, there were other things that they did, but it was not an anti-health center vote. One of the things we prided ourselves on, and this guy right here, you remember Bob Caston? Oh, John. I mean, talk about a everyone? tough arm. Yeah, but I mean, you're my hero, because at a time when, this is when we were fighting being block granted into oblivion and death, okay, during the Reagan years, um, and um, you had Prox, who was, of course, good, wonderful, a little bit conservative, but uh, he'd vote the right way. And then he had Bob Caston. And he was like, true idea, I'm voting with the president, I'm voting with Somehow you turned him around, thank God, because that was what made the difference in keeping this program alive. Uh, 
Sometimes it's that. I see. I, you're you're under you're understating your influence considerably uh, on that. But it was it was folks like you, John, in the states and in the communities, one on one with the members, telling the story and why it's important that made a difference. We were actually able to beat back that block grant, or we wouldn't be here today. <clears throat> so we've had our ups and downs. But even with the cuts that Congress has taken, 60% of that 50, of the $11 billion has not been spent yet. It doesn't become available until next year and then the year after that. There is money to grow. Congress said, we're going to expand coverage. We're going to give people Medicaid. We're going to give other subsidies to purchase private insurance. They're going to need a place to go to get care. We need you health centers to stand up more care. Open more sites, extend your hours, hire more staff, get out there and serve more people. We need you to do that. And the money will be available. When I look at your strategic plan, why I think you're absolutely right on, what's your first priority? What's your first priority? Growth. Exactly. <laughs> that is so part of our core DNA. From day one, health centers focus has been on growing, not just for the purpose of growing, but because there's so much, as Robert Frost says in his poem, I have miles to go before I sleep, I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. There is so much unfinished business that we have in this country. So many people, you know, we talk about 50 million uninsured. And the Affordable Care Act will reduce that down to about 30 million. But there are 60 million people in America today who do not have a family doctor or a health care home. They don't have a regular source of preventive and primary care. 60 million, that's one out of every five. Even though we're serving 22 million people, there are still 60 million people out there with no place to call home when they need a pap smear or they need a vaccination. I was in the, <laughs> the Chavez clinic today and the kids were crying, you know. They hadn't even, I said, I said in Spanish, did, did she get a shot? No, not yet. And the baby's crying and screaming. <clears throat> That's good health care. That's good health care, man. Um, but, you know, when they need that kind of stuff, people need a place to go, but they need a place they can call home. And that's what you do. So what are we fighting for on your behalf right now? Number one, there's $700 million in new funding for health centers to grow health centers uh, next year, which starts October 1. First, we've got to keep the lights on, okay, for the rest of government. But when they do, this money automatically becomes available and can be spent to expand health centers, do more Oral health, I, I see what you're doing with UWM, and, or no, Marquette. Uh, on the dentistry program, so important. There are more dentally uninsured people in this country than medically uninsured. Um, for, for behavioral health, for mental health and, and addiction uh, care, um, and for pharmacy services, for vision care, for podiatry care, there is so much need in these things, and these resources will be available to help you grow the number of people you serve and expand the services you provide, okay? So as you put together your growth plan, okay, know that we will continue to fight for those resources, and in fact, for at least the next couple of years, those resources, I am confident, will become available, will be available. So it won't be wasted effort to spend some time thinking through, should we apply for another grant, to do expanded services, to do a new access point to grow the number of people, just to add hours to our operation so that we can serve more people in the same facilities. Creative ways to reach out and serve more people. There will be money and we're fighting for that. 3.8 billion in total funding for health centers next year, of which 700 million is brand new first time. And it will be there the next year too. And on top of that, there'll be 1.4 billion in new funding in 2015 to grow the program again. So 700 million next year, an additional 1.4 billion in 2015. And then we're gonna have to fight to keep that money 
for the next five years so that what you do grow will continue. But we'll do that by all working together. We've never, have we, John? Never lost a big fight. Never. We're also going to be fighting to keep the Medicaid payment system, what's called the PPS, or the cost-based reimbursement, or some people call it FQHC, which is just another name for Community Health Center. Um, we're going to keep that alive in Medicaid. And we got language in the Affordable Care Act that would require in these new exchanges the plans to pay health centers their FQHC PPS payment rate. That's being honored more in the breach than in reality right now. We haven't fought, we haven't gone to court to force it because we understand right now that for those who are trying to get the Affordable Care Act up off the ground, they have simply got to have health insurance. How many health insurance plans here in the state are you looking at? Three. Three. In Milwaukee. In, in Milwaukee. Well, that's, that's reasonably good. There are places where there's only one or two plans um, in states with the federally operated exchanges. If there's not enough, if there are not enough insurers to come in and offer coverage in these exchanges, the whole Affordable Care Act collapses. If we push our demand that the plans pay PPS, some plans will bow out. They just won't offer coverage. And if that happens, I'm doing the domino thing. The Affordable Care Act collapses. So we have decided to hold our fire and jawbone. And we have. We've had good meetings with folks at HHS right up to, and as I said yesterday, uh, just yesterday, two days ago, with the Secretary, Secretary Sebelius, and her Deputy Secretary, Bill Corr. We continue to talk to them. We will get that fixed and sorted out, um, both for Medicaid and for the exchange coverage. We're going to do that. Those are the things that we'll be fighting for. Close with this, and then I'm open for questions. So what can be done right now? What needs to be done right now? What can you do to make a difference here in Milwaukee um, and together with health centers all across the country, everywhere? Find and enroll the people who qualify for coverage. There are 30 million Americans who in three short weeks are going to be able to enroll. Okay, That's even with states like Wisconsin who refused to expand Medicaid. There will still be almost 30 million people who will qualify for Medicaid. And by the way, in the state of Wisconsin, the last time I looked, there are 400,000 Wisconsinites who are eligible for Medicaid today and are not enrolled. That's an outrage. And if Scott Walker won't expand Medicaid, would you do me a favor and find those 400,000 people and stick them up his butt? Okay? He says he doesn't want to expand Medicaid because those folks are going to come out of the woodwork and he won't get 100% federal funding for them because they're already eligible for Medicaid. They were last year. They were the year before that. They've just never been enrolled. Okay? Um, so that's the reason he turned down 100% funding for 600,000 new people? The logic escapes me. But you got to find those people. And you got to find those folks who will qualify for subsidies to purchase coverage in the exchange. If we don't do it, you know, there's this whole, the whole part of the back and forth in Washington has been the Congress has refused to fund at an adequate level the necessary foundation for standing up these exchanges and getting them operating and getting people enrolled in coverage. Among the very little amount of money that has come online and been made available is $150 million from our growth fund. This was supposed to be used to grow health centers. It was from the Affordable Care Act $11 billion fund. And the White House came to us and said, Dan, Tom, we have to use this money to put outreach workers in your health centers 
so you can help find and enroll these people. Otherwise, this, this is going to be a disaster. Can you go along with that? <clears throat> and we said, you know what? Yeah. Because we understand how important it is for this seminal moment in our country and in our history as a society for us to do the right thing for our people and our communities. We've got to help find and enroll those people. And I know, John, I've looked, you have outreach and enrollment workers, you had them before, and now with these new resources, hopefully, and, and uh, uh, Progressive and others receive funding, you'll be able to get out there and do that. First, with your patients who are uninsured and who will qualify for coverage in the exchange or whatever. And then secondly, out in your community, beyond the four walls of the health center, to the people who don't come to your health center today, maybe in part because they're uninsured and they're embarrassed, or they don't know about your sliding fee, whatever the reason is, they need to be touched and reached also. So if there is one thing that every single health center in America can do, it is get out there, knock on doors, um, uh, put, go to community meetings, press the word forward, help people to figure out whether they qualify and if they do, help them to enroll. That is the, other than the care you provide every day, that is the single most important thing that you can do and need to do. So I want to close with a quote um, that I've kind of carried around with me because uh, I, I think it's neat. Um, it comes from Forbes magazine. Anybody know what Forbes is? It is the holy grail of free market enterprise. Forbes. Remember Steve Forbes? He ran for president once, okay? This is a business-focused magazine, and its readership is that. And a woman named Carolyn McClanahan, who is a regular staff writer there, wrote recently, and by the way, it was called One Little Gem in Our Vast Health System. That was the title of it. She said, one gem of our healthcare system is the vast network of community health centers. A strong healthcare system is important for our country's resiliency and is a matter of national defense. I love that. It would be great if we could cut some of the billions in wasted overhead from our health care system and divert just a couple of billion per year to community health centers. We would all be so much better for that. This woman believes in us. So now, do you believe in us? How, if she does, how can you not? Okay? So what's, what's, what's to be said? If she is out there saying this is a gem of a healthcare system, and among those 1,200 gems across America, you have one of the brightest, the jewel in the crown, 16th Street, which for years, for years, has been seen as the North Star the, uh, among the creme de la creme, uh, the one look to, as you were in the meeting earlier this week with your colleagues who look to you for, John, how are you doing that? How can we do that? Can we come see what you're doing and stuff like that? Um, you have raised up, John, a fabulous health care system here in, the, in this city. I thought you were always that color. I thought it was the 3 o'clock beer. No, seriously, you do have a gem. You should be proud of it. Um, John is the guy at the helm, but every one of you who works for 16th Street and every one of you who serves on the board should be proud of what you have built. Now fight like hell to hold on to it and work hard to grow it because that's what we need to do. So I thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. I thank you for what you do every day. You make a difference in people's lives. Remember what I said? That's what dragged me to South Texas 40 years ago. I'm not sure what difference I make in anybody's lives, but I know what a difference you do in your daily work and in your service to your community on the board, the difference you make. Recognize that. Don't poo-poo it. Don't poo-poo it, John. Recognize what you have accomplished 
And don't get a big pet about it. Recognize the responsibility we all have to carry it forward. That's the key. And I wish you Godspeed as you move forward and we all move forward in this good country. Thank you. So now we're rethinking the whole strategy to look at do we spend most of our energy going after those newly eligible Medicaid patients that we know we're going to get PPS with versus spending a lot of energy trying to go after an enrolling exchange place. Um, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to give you my two cents, but it, it is colored by my life and my focus um, and the things I care about. Um, sometimes it's not easy at all to do the right thing. Um, even if you can't afford to care for these folks because you just don't have the financial wherewithal to write off all those uh, the sliding fee discounts because they're they're uh, because of their deductible, I still think you have a responsibility to help them enroll in coverage, even if they end up going somewhere else uh, for their care. For your own patients who are uninsured today and who will qualify for exchange coverage, I would hope, even though there is great, undoubtedly, disappointment, that they will not have the kind of coverage that will bring more revenues into the health center, you'll be no worse off with those people should they gain exchange coverage um, and they continue to come to you um, and their deductible is so high th that they cannot afford and the plan will not pay for their care. What you will be doing by getting them coverage is at least <coughs> making it possible when your clinicians find that they need a consult or a diagnostic or a hospital admit, they'll have a form of coverage that will make it at least a little bit easier for you to get that care for them outside your four walls that they need but you don't provide directly. So I would hope that you would still try to pretty aggressively get out and at least inform people of the coverage opportunities and availability. Here's what we're going to do, John, for you and for every other health center. That money that I spoke of that was in the Affordable Care Act, $700 million in new funding this year, you remember when we used to fight for $25 million? I mean, th this is some pretty big bucks, $1.4 billion in 2015. We're going to keep that money coming. And if you um, there will be an opportunity in the next year to apply for expanded services and that includes the old EMC expanded medical capacity more hours in your same and better use of your same facilities but money to hire staff and operate even though you will have a fairly significant population that remains effectively uninsured which will include these people who have exchange coverage but for whom, for you at least, it means nothing. We will get you the grant funds you need to cover those costs. Because I am convinced that this can only go on so long where the deductibles are so large that the people can't afford to pay them. Um, I believe that within two or three years there's going to be an uproar and pressure on Congress to put more money into the system. And if the system is doing where is moving where it seems to be moving, you know, for the last three, almost four years in a row, the growth rate of health care spending has dropped to near zero. It's grown two to three percent, whereas it in the in the nineties and the early aughts, uh, it was growing 10, 15 percent a year. Suddenly the growth is dropping. Some of that is the value base, some of it is the ACOs, the accountable care organ. It's a different way of things being done. Some of it's the medical home model, 
which is actually helping others to do what we already did, which is reduce specialty care, reduce emergency room, reduce hospital admits and readmits that aren't necessary. The rest of the system is doing that. As the healthcare system, because I said we've got to get healthcare spending under control. As the healthcare system right sizes itself, I am absolutely convinced that the American public will demand and Congress and the White House will agree to lower the out of pocket costs for individuals who have these kinds of policies, especially those on the exchange, so that the premium support, what's called premium support, which is really both premium and deductible copay um, assistance will get better and the out-of-pocket will not be nearly as great and if they're your patients at that point you'll be in much better shape in the interim we will get you the grant funds to cover those losses so that you can continue to care for them because that's first of all me Dan Hawkins that's where I want them going to your health center okay number two is a business decision that's where you want them going because when things get better for them, it's going to be better for you. Now, the other thing I will say, too, okay, is that although it's a fairly narrow band of folks, um, and things change, maybe not immediately, maybe not as fast as we want them to, but um, at some point, um, in other states, Health centers have banded together with the hospitals who have a great stake in whether the state truly follows through on the Medicaid expansion um, and with consumer groups and with business groups who understand that this is good for business to do the Medicaid expansion, to get 100% federal funding, even when it drops to 90%, it is still the best deal going um, and have been able to convince governors and state legislators. Just yesterday, Tom Corbett, who is a very conservative Republican governor of Pennsylvania, said, having said no, not quite Rick Perry, hell no, but no, we're not going to expand Medicaid. Rick Perry's an idiot. I mean, he showed that to the whole world when he ran. But, but, uh, but Corbett's not quite that idiot. He's kind of an ideologue. He, yeah, couldn't remember number three, right? You remember that? Uh, oops. <laughs> but at any rate, um, uh, Tom Corbett is not that kind of guy. He's not an idiot and he's not an, he, not an ideologue. He is conservative. Had said no. He single, signaled yesterday that they're going for the Medicaid expansion. Rick Snyder of Michigan is now four square behind. In fact, the state, he got the legislature, which was dominated by his party <coughs> in both chambers, to pass the Medicaid expansion. It's going to happen. Ohio, I think John Kasich is going to go for it. Slowly but surely, hmm? well, Jan Brewer, what she did, vetoing bills that had nothing to do with health care and said, I'm going to continue to veto them until the legislature passes my Medicaid expansion. Um, if we remember, Paul, you remember, the history of Medicaid itself started in 1965. It was 1982 before Arizona, the last state, finally came into Medicaid, 17 years. It's not going to take that long. Every state is going to do the Medicaid expansion and also, we'll talk about this, take the operation of the exchanges. They're fools to leave it to the feds. Well, I was Paul? just going to say, your, your comment about banding together the hospital association, I gotta sit down. the medical society, <sighs> the business community, the media, all did try to influence the governor's decision on the expansion. And he said, hell no, and has to this point stayed with it. And because we believe, many of us believe, that his aspiration really is to 2016, we don't see him backing off of that just simply because of his base. So mm -hmm. long term, you may be right. But in the next few years, moving Scott off of that I won't take it is going to be pretty darn tough. Yeah. Well, that may well be and may take two or three years. You're probably right. You've got a much better feel than I do. Um, but even if it takes two or three years, it will happen. And they will come around. Um, and, and for that population, at least, up to 138, yeah, I know. Well, hell, if we could just get bag, Badger Care back, what was that, up to 200? Yeah, geez, you know, at some point, maybe. 
Yeah, of all people. <laughs> do we have other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. I feel like we need to be studiously careful about not personifying what people are doing. Yeah, I'm sure. My question yeah. has to do with, with um, because I'm in medical education, where does the expanded need for primary care providers and the training thereof, where does that fit into the picture? Um, we've talked a lot about training, teaching THCs and mm -hmm. stuff like that. That's a limited pot of money that is finite and is in some ways because it's that problematic <coughs> commitment for CDC. But where do you come into the big um, national um, discussion about expansion of training sessions, training places that would bump it? Two things I would say. Um, um, uh, I, there are two other programs. When I, I, I tend not to do a very good job of, of making this clear uh, when I speak, but there are really three programs that we fought for in the Affordable Care Act and that we are prepared to fight for to continue. One is community health centers. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the second is the National Health Service Corps, which also got cut after it was tripled. Its funding was tripled through the Affordable Care Act. So now it's only twice as big as it was before. Um, but we're going to get it back and back up and going. And of course, the score, the core with its scholarship and loan repayment assistance is a vitally important, I know that doesn't do residency training and such, but it does at least, hopefully, allow us to find and fund a more diverse student body in, me in medicine and dentistry and nursing and elsewhere. And it needs to be much bigger. But we're going to fight for that. And the third you mentioned teaching health centers. Kind of a baby program, but the first money of any kind that Congress has ever given for residency training outside of Medicare GME. Uh, and, and try as we have over the years, our good friends at AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, have uh, made it very clear to us that even though it would be pretty inexpensive and it might even be pretty effective that over their dead bodies would they give up any of their GME nine billion dollars a year in GME funding uh, just through Medicare alone that doesn't even count Medicaid um, <clears throat> and uh, we have tested the waters I'm going back 20 years okay on the hill with our friends on the key committees and found that while they've the vast majority agree that our cause is right. They're not going to go up against that Magilla. So we want to grow the Teaching Health Center program. It's the first foray, successful foray, we've ever had into federal financing of residency training outside of Medicare. Whenever we wanted to do that separately, they said, no, you got all that GME money. Don't tell me. Go get there. Go get the money over there. Now they understand it. And we have already begun discussions with members because we know that right now, if you were funded for a teaching health center, there's only two years worth of funding left. How can you get a commitment or commit to a student for three years when there's only two years of funding left? So we have made it eminently clear that even before we have to fix the health center funding cliff or the National Health Service Corps funding cliff, we've got to fix the Teaching Health Center funding cliff. That's a priority for us. I didn't mention it, but I should have. Um, secondly, although no other programs, health professions training programs, got any money, real money, in the Affordable Care Act, they got authorizations. That and the you know, whatever gets you. There was the one nurse training program that was based on the health center, Mark Maselli's um, advanced nurse training that got a little bit of money, but that was basically it. Um, I mentioned the team model of care 
that health centers embody and that you do at your sites, um, we need, because we're not going to be able to stand up enough primary care physicians uh, and train them and deploy them in time. So we have got to maximize that team model um, and expand training of nurse practitioners, PAs, and nurse midwives big time, and dental extenders as well. We need hygienists and we need uh, dental therapists. Uh, so we've got to do all of that. It can't just be about physicians and dentists. We've got to do more team-based training. And the best place, the best place in America for anybody, a dental student, a resident, a nurse practitioner trainee, whoever, the best place for them to train uh, and get that experience in team-based care is at a health center. So we're going to work to make that happen. Yeah. There is so much I fear overwhelming you, but on our website, which is www.nachc, we say NAC, but it's our acronym, .org. On the front page of the website, there's an outreach and enrollment button, and if you go there, there are materials that explain in fairly simple terms. There are also links to other organizations like Enroll America, who we are partnered with, Families USA, um, the Young Invincibles, I love their name. They sort of like Obamacare. They said, you know what, you call us that like it's an insult and we're going to grab it ourselves. We will proudly say it. Um, but the Young Invincibles who are young folks that everybody thinks won't buy insurance because they don't think they need it. Um, and in fact, this group is focused on reaching out to young invincibles <laughs> to convince them that they do and they should, and they need to buy that coverage. There's great stuff. There's video, there's um, uh, video clips for um, mobile technology, smartphones. There's printed material. There's everything you could possibly need. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what it's about. A, a leave behind that you can leave with them, as well as talking points for you to use and talking to them about it. Yeah, and, and by the way, um, each, since each of the health centers got funded for outreach and enrollment, and anybody you hire with that money is going to have to go through the training that CMS is loading up online. You can do it at your own leisure. There's not a set time. There will be, what do you call those? No, 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 the, the Webinar. online webinars. Not, not just webinars, but interactive. Well, no, it can't be interactive because you can do it whenever. If you want to do it at 2 a.m. in the morning, you can do it. They'll be uploaded. There's a series, like a course, that you're going to have to take. I think it's 20 hours of training that the work. But it's not restricted only to those who were hired with that money. You can go in and do it. Board member can go in and do it. Um, regular staffer can go in and do at least go through the first one because that's the basics of how to do what's new as a result of the Affordable Care Act, what do people need to know, and how to explain it to them in simple terms. Because, you know, this is not, you're not going to want to use the King's English here. You gotta, you're not going to want to use the kind of acronyms that I throw around, you know. Inside the Beltway in Washington, that may work, but out here in the real world, you start talking about exchanges and qualified health plans, God forbid you should call them QHPs, you'll lose them completely. You got to talk to them in terms they can understand and grasp and then give them something to take with them. Oui. of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, or in-person training that they have to go through. So um, our plan is that three of these staff are going to be doing community outreach. So they'll be out in 
community locations, um, doing some presentations or meeting one-on-one -on -one with people out in the community, so to try and get that word out, and, um, to try and get people help in line. So we all have talking points. And what you probably don't know, because it's kind of in the weeds for Wisconsin, but <coughs> the brokers got to the insurance commissioner and the insurance commissioner put more stringent requirements on enrollment people. All enrollment people, because let me tell you, I know that in some states they've done that and they've called them navigators or certified assistance counselors. Your people are none of the above. None of the above. And if they, if a state, and this is um, um, uh, Mary Wakefield at HRSA and Deputy Secretary Bill Corr, who said to me, if you find a state that puts up a rule or regulation or even a law that proves to be a barrier to the ability of these outreach and enrollment workers to do their job, tell us, we're going to blow right by it. You know, if they are going to require licensure, a fee, and stuff like that, you should not be intimidated by that. Uh, comply as much as you can with what's not unreasonable. But if it gets unreasonable, let us know, and we'll go fight the good fight, and, and you l just let you guys blow right past that well, and get out there. There is more on this because this state is doing license and fees, and not for the Medicaid enrollers, but for those the, the brokers initially thought you're going to take all of our business away. As this sort of unfolded, they realized, well, we don't necessarily really want the business in those neighborhoods or oh, yeah. clinics, so they backed off a little bit, but. As this sort of grows out a little bit, and we start yeah. encroaching on their potential um, uh, patients to be enrolled, this is a fight that's going to be had. Yeah. Well, let's have it. I mean, I, I, my point is, I'm ready to help in any way we can. Anybody who finishes that training and wants to become certified has to take a test, and the fee for that is $75. If you fail the test, then it would be $75 again to retake it. <laughs> yeah, that's it's like the old poll tax thing I said. You know, they're just throwing up barriers, and and, and I think n probably not to try to. Although I shouldn't be so naive to try to reduce the number of people who get coverage or can get through the process, uh, just because, like you said, the agents and brokers, you know, feel like this is an incursion into their turf. <clears throat> but that's outrageous. You know, uh, things that get in the way of folks being able to, to enroll in coverage for which they qualify is... Can I mention that? <clears throat> as, as having our walk talk, we're part of one of the 10 consortia in the state. <laughs> And uh, we are the lead agency for the Grand Lakes, which is Washington, Waukesha, Walworth, Ozaki, and Fond du Lac counties. And um, I was at an all-day meeting where anybody who was involved in this whole process was invited to come. And there were about 85 people there. And much to my surprise, because I had never even thought about it, I would say about 20, 25 of them were brokers and agents. <laughs> so. They're all trying to decide where they fit in. Uh-huh. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> Why am I not surprised? They understand this is the next frontier, you know, or the last frontier. I hope this has been helpful. Um, again, I, I, I give you all the credit in the world for thinking strategically, because we all have to think strategically. What is the future? What is the future of our health care system? Our, our, our health center, what is the future of the health care system in Milwaukee? Where is our state going? Um, <clears throat> and where are we going as a country? But I just ask you always to keep in mind, for whom? For whom? For whom? Who do you exist to serve? Who is it your goal to reach out to and care for? Who is it that you want to be the health care home for? 
Always keep the who in mind. That's, that's our North Star. That is the people who need us. Always. Okay? Go forth and do great work.